Please welcome Eddie Romain. too high, is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's really high. I couldn't do it. Um, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on a, a really fantastic se uh, series. I've gotten to see the first two, so I'm cheating a little bit. It just gets better and better. Um, whenever we have people as accomplished as you, I always actually love to go back to the beginning. Um, what do you consider your first job as an actor? My first job as an actor, my first job as a, uh, firstly, by the way, thank you for being so kind, because you, you are pretty much the first audience to see any of you. job as an actor was in a production of Oliver, the musical Oliver, um, in the West End in London with Jonathan Price playing Fagin. And I was one of about sort of 50 children in it. And I wasn't in the gang. And for people who know Oliver, if you're a child, everyone assumes you're in the gang. But I wasn't even in the gang. I was just a sort of workhouse urchin. Um, and, but what I remember was I was at school at the time, I was 11 years old, and I used to be able to get up in the middle of maths class and leave and go and get on the tube and go to the London Palladium, which is one of the most beautiful, oldest theatres in London, and perform with Jonathan Price. And I, I was so seduced by the romance and the kind of that grease paint quality that I basically, that was me addicted, yeah. I mean, did you ever consider a different career just because you've been doing this since you were so young? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I studied history of art at university. I definitely had the backup. Um, I, my family don't come, um, aren't sort of theatrical or don't come from this world at all. And they were always, whilst being very supportive, had that, that, that fear, as we all know, of the statistics of acting and employment. And so I studied history of art, and there was a part of me that thought about maybe being um, a curator, or um, but I'm so thrilled that I get to do it again. <laughs> uh, well, again, congratulations. I keep calling it a series, but I kind of think of it as a movie, like a five, six hour movie, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah, it's so, and I'm so jealous you guys got to see it on a big screen. Um, I know this story is based on a Frederick Forsyth novel, and there was a previous adaptation. What did you know about it coming in? Was it something you'd always been interested in, or you got a new script and it piqued your interest? So oddly, it, yeah, I think quite families often have that film, mm -hmm. um, and for my for my family, the Day of the Jackal was one of the three. It was the Day of the Jackal, Pretty Woman, <laughs> and Dirty Dancing, which is quite a sort of yes. trio. All of which I watched incredibly and appropriately young. Um, remake Dirty Dancing next. Say again. Remake. Dirty Dancing next. <laughs> no one wants to see that. <laughs> um, uh, but at the day of the Jekyll, it was this battered old VHS in our house, and I loved it from when I was little. And I've been recently trying to work out why. And I, I think ultimately it's because he's an actor. The mm. the, the character is an actor in all, in all senses, and. In the original movie, for, for those who haven't seen it, you know, he's, he's sort of, it's, it's even, it's more lo-fi, so he's painting his hair and he's um, sort of sticking his leg up um, and using crutches. And, but that, the theatricality of it and that analogue quality of it was something that I'd always loved. So when these scripts arrived in my inbox, I was, that was great trepidation because it is, the Zimmerman movie is astonishing and Edward Fox is just a sort of, vessel of charisma um but what i read was something said now and that retained the dna of the character that i loved and the movie that i loved but felt completely fresh but had that quality of those 70s thrillers that i i love that again that analog rather than digital everything you know he's a craftsman it's about the the, the spy craft almost and and those were the movies that I had loved growing up, so yeah. I was gonna say, it's like, it's strange because it feels really timeless in some ways, but it's also so timely mm. coming out now. Like, I did, I, it's, it's strange how it can be both things at once. Mm. Um, and how did you go about preparing for this? Because, I, well, uh, specifically the spy stuff. 
Because <laughs> do you get to talk to spies? Because they shouldn't let you. <laughs> I didn't get to um, talk to spies that I'm aware of, um, but I did get to speak to, there was this brilliant man called Paul Biddish, who was our military and espionage advisor. That's a spy. Which I think is basically, it's not only a spy, one of the greatest job titles in Christendom. <laughs> it's like, um, but to show his versatility, he also was working on Gladiator 2 at the same time, so I love this idea of doing Centurions one day and sort of the Jackal the other day. Um, but he was amazing, and 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 Lashana, both Lashana and I spent a couple of days in London with him, and he brought in all his the tools of his trade, and they were they were some of them beautifully archaic, like you know um, buttons that that were cameras, uh, <laughs> but also brilliant things like high vis vests, so sort of fluorescent yellow vests that work workmen wear because it transpires that in that world, hiding in plain sight, you know, if you're trying to get out of a busy or a frenzied scenario, you put on a plane, you know, one of those vests and no one looks at you. He taught us things like that you use coins. If you have your hands in your pockets and someone comes at you, throwing shrapnel coins into people's eyes is a mm. distraction. Using phones, going for the jugular. Tampons, very important for, for <laughs> it transpires for, um, for clogging bullet wounds. Um, so there was, a, but then in London, he had us, or well, he taught, taught me about using reflections in windows and, 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 and car mirrors to kind of see people when they're trailing you. And then he had me, after the theory class, sent me around Covent Garden in central London. And to my phone, he would send these images of people that I had to track. And then, then, I'd, get a, and then I'd get another one saying someone was tracing me and I had to, film surreptitiously all the footage that I could get of this person. This guy's uh, a spy. He's a proper spy. I love that this was my job, was to get to do this. So I sort of run around Covent Garden pretending to be a spy. Um, anyway, I thought it was going really well until I was going past this it, Covent Garden, for those who haven't been in London, is where you know they're very central and there would be loads of tourists and there was this guy standing as one of those like statues, like moving statues. And I was going past him shooting this footage and then this group of tourists from China turned and asked for a selfie, which gave away, I thought I was doing such a good job. <laughs> and then the person I was trying to attack and the person that was thinking me, it all ended up disastrously. You were disguised as Eddie Redmayne. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't so good. The freckles all gave away. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet this character is so kind of fluent. Yeah. And so when I arrived in Hungary, where we shot a lot of it, I went to meet the amazing props man who had designed this case. And he showed me how to put it together and I tried very hack-handedly. And I said, look, I've got, to, I've got to take this home with me and to practice. And he said, um, okay. And I took it home. And as I arrived at the hotel, there was a protest going on outside the hotel, thousands of students um, in Budapest protesting, more armed policemen than you have ever seen in your life. Mm. And I couldn't get to the hotel, so I said, oh, well, I'm just gonna have to wheel this case to the hotel. And I was wheeling the case through, and one of the students recognized me and stopped me and asked for a, a selfie, at which point the paparazzi were there photographing, not the paparazzi, but the photographers were there photographing the protest, and they started taking photos of me, and I had this case, and then all the police were there with the arm thing, I was like, this is a catastrophe waiting for Anyway, I managed to get into the hotel, which is fine. And then that night, I started trying to put the gun together, and, and I put, and it was, but the hotel was in the equivalent in Budapest of Times Square, basically, and I was, and I managed to put the, the gun together the first time, and it had taken me forever. I was like, this is a disaster, I'm gonna have to work. Anyway, I left it and went downstairs for some supper, and I was eating goulash, <laughs> and I suddenly went, fuck, fuck, and I spilled the goulash, ran upstairs, because I'd left this full-blown sniper yeah. rifle <laughs> I on my desk. Um, and, oh, and, 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 and as I ran from the lift to the room, I ran past the turndown service gentleman who was there sort of with the chocolates. Oh, so and just the thought of if he had gone in and seen oh, this gigantic yeah. sniper oh, rifle oh, aimed out over the Budapest equivalent of Times Square would have been just catastrophic. So 
Um, anyway, the answer, that really doesn't answer your question. Does it? <laughs> Sounds pretty real. <laughs> um, I don't know how it really does. It's very real. Very yeah. real. <laughs> By the way, um, when people come up to you and, and when they approach you, what is it they want to talk about most? Is it fantastic beasts or theory? Do you know, it completely varies. Yeah. It can go from theory generationally to um, Danish Girl to Fantastic Beasts to Trial of Chicago 7. Of course. And then, and then if they've worked in the medical industry, the goodness. Oh, gosh. <laughs> sort of, you know, I would think they would turn and walk away if they saw you. Yeah, well, I think, I think, I think it's so, that story was so scary for people who work in that world. Yeah. Yeah. No Les Mis fans? Oh, a few Les Mis fans. Okay. Yeah, they're definitely, def when I was doing cabaret, which I just finished doing in New York, lots of um, the musical theatre. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, there were lots of Les, Les Mis fans, but I just can't get over because with the Les Mis fans, people are like, I had a crush on you when I was sort of eight in Les Mis and then now sort of 28. <laughs> 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 oh God, it's so long ago. <laughs> I don't know how long it's been, but it's been oh quite a long time. Gosh, yeah. yeah. I just, you know, it's so random. I saw Hugh Jackman not too long ago, and he was complaining about having to lug you around it's in the suit. Bloody true. Like, he's still bitter. Oh, man, I'm not afraid <laughs> because also, it being a Tom Hooper movie, he didn't just have to lug me around. He had to lug, lug me around a sewer in shit for two <laughs> days. Well, I remember we had our eyes were, yeah, covered in. Fake excrement, but it still wasn't particularly attractive. And he's like, and, and then also to be fair, Hugh being Hugh, he, I think there was a kind of um, for, for the wide shots, a kind yeah. of a doll he could have used. But you know, Hugh, he wants to, <laughs> he wants to fully commit to everything. So yeah. he did complain. He was like, he's a big guy. He's like, people don't understand. He's very tall. I, I absolutely. It's weird. I don't know if I have a sort of. I have this weird thing where people sort of. Occasionally, because you're actually taller than you appear. Oh. I don't know if I have a sort of no you know, diminutive. No, no, no. It's, it's actors are always shorter than you think. Always, yeah, especially out here. Yeah, you're always. <laughs> What's that saying? That was said with some kind of. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Yeah, what? That was pretty disastrous. There was a Star Wars one that was pretty bad. What? Yeah, because I just went to audition for. Um, I think it was Adam Driver's role, but they didn't tell us what it was, and they gave us, in the way they do now, you yeah. know, how to read an actual script, so I was doing a scene from Pride and Prejudice or something, like, to play, <laughs> but I was told he was a sci-fi baddie, and, and it was Nina Gold, who is an amazing <laughs> casting director, who cast me in so many things, and, and so I knew her really quite well, and I did ten takes of Pride and Prejudice in my sci-fi voice. <laughs> What's your sci-fi voice? <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what he does. Yeah, but but he hadn't done Jupiter Ascending, in which I had also done like this and won a Razzie for the worst performance of the year. Um, so I did ten takes of this, and Nina was like, I was like, and should, should I try again? She's like, I think, I think you're probably done here, aren't you? <laughs> well, that's kind of what happened in The Hobbit. You were trying to do a Hobbit. I was trying to do a Hobbit voice. Yeah. Note to self, don't do voices. <laughs> but you can do it in the moment, right? I did. Yeah. yeah. Like you tried to correct it, and it just. Went. I I tried to yeah I tried well I was trying desperately in 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 Hobbit voice to sort of um to to you know do my interpretation of Bilbo Baggins and I just went I I, I went to theatrical. My name is Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a camera here and it didn't quite it didn't quite work in closer. <laughs> it's like I have told your story so many times imitating you. Oh yeah. I, 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 want, I want to hear that. Just, you just did. Yeah. <laughs>